respected members of the Sangha, distinguished guests and friends from the Canadian Parliament, leaders of the Tibetan community, the President and members of the Tibetan Canadian Cultural Center, and dear friends, brothers and sisters. On behalf of the Office of Tibet, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for this invitation. It's good to be here on my first official visit to Toronto. So what I see before me this evening is really a manifestation of what I would call the second great churning or turning of the wheel in our small Tibetan community. We had the first big movement back in the early 60s when as a result of Chinese persecution, aggression and occupation, more than 80,000 Tibetans fled to freedom and lived in exile in India and Nepal. And because of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's leadership and guidance, Tibetans were able to establish settlements across Indian subcontinent. And because of the generosity of the Indian government as a host, they let us stay there. And we're still there as a community. We were able to build schools, rebuild some of the monasteries and cultural institutions that were destroyed by the Chinese and it's now a refugee community that has been in India and Nepal for over 50 years. But over the last 10 years or so, we're seeing a second great turning of the wheel where we're witnessing a major demographic transition with many of our community members deciding to immigrate to the West, especially to North America, to Europe and Australia. So today, so many of you who are here in Toronto, you make up the second largest community, Tibetan community in North America. So if present trends continue, it is the view of the current Kashak, the current leadership in Dharamsala, that it's just a matter of time before the number of Tibetans who live in the West will either equal or exceed the number of Tibetans in India and Nepal. So this very large demographic shift presents both challenges and opportunities for us and the Tibetan leadership is very aware of this and we're looking at ways of how we can both respond and and take advantage of this uh, this development so in the nine months that I have served as a representative of His Holiness to the Americas. One of the issues that I've been putting a fair amount of my time and thought into is how can we structure a new kind of relationship between the Central Tibet Administration and the Office of Tibet and with the growing diaspora community here in Canada, in the US, and elsewhere. So as many of you may be aware, the leadership in Dharamsala has responded by launching a number of initiatives such as through the Department of Home we have the Sister Shijak, where we're encouraging Tibetan communities in the West to embrace and adopt 
one of the settlements, one or more of the settlements in India and Nepal. So I hope the leadership here in Toronto will consider that. The other program, which again I have shared with you in the past, is an opportunity for Tibetan students here, Tibetan professionals, and as well as members of the retired community here, to re-engage with their community, to give back through a program called Tibet Corp. The Sikyong has himself mentioned in his last March 10th statement that Tibetans everywhere are welcome to come back to India, to serve in the CTA, to come to the settlements and contribute their skills, their talents, their resources. Because one of the key operating principles of the current Tibetan leadership is self-reliance. I feel that our community as a whole, that we've achieved a critical mass where we can now seriously look ourselves within and find that talent, find those resources within to help ourselves. Because eventually, it is on us, we have the responsibility of driving this movement, this freedom movement forward. So in the nine months that I have assumed this position, I'm pleased to let you know that things are going well. It's been a very busy nine months. In this, life, in this last nine months, we've had the wonderful opportunity of hosting His Holiness the Dalai Lama twice. We had the Sikyong, Dr. Lopsang Sangye, visit North America twice. We had the Speaker of our Parliament, Mr. Temba Sring. He came once. And also, especially during these last few weeks, we were able to move our office from New York to Washington, D.C. And just to share with you a little bit of a background and reason why the office has moved from New York to D.C. Traditionally, the Office of Tibet, we've had three areas of responsibility. The number one and the biggest responsibility is to represent and manage His Holiness's visits to North America. So that really is a key core area of responsibility for us and continues to be. The second is really the welfare of the diaspora Tibetan community here, which as I was saying earlier, it's really growing at a rapid pace. And today, we have 32 different Tibetan associations across North America. We have 26 in the US and six in Canada. And even though we don't have a fully accurate data, but it is our estimate that there are approximately about 20,000 Tibetans at the moment in North America. So this office that I represent has over the years worked really closely with you all, has supported you, provided services, and that continues to be an area of focus for us. But this move to Washington, D.C. has also added a third and an equally important layer which is taking on directly the work of political advocacy and building relationships and connections with the Canadian Parliament, the U.S. Congress, the Canadian government and the U.S. government. Because the current Kashak, the 14th Kashak, especially after His Holiness's historic decision in 2011, to devolve all political power to an elected leader. It is now the responsibility of the current Kashyap to really take on this political role. So as a result, after thinking things through very carefully, 
the decision was made to move the office to Washington, D.C. and to enhance and to increase the political advocacy work, which, as you know, is really the most important work. Because the reason why the Central Tibetan Administration exists, its whole reason for being, is to come to a mutually agreeable solution on the Tibet issue, restore freedom, and and make true a dream, which is to see His Holiness return to Tibet, as has been the aspiration of our brothers and sisters in Tibet. So today what I want to share with you is Tibetans are a very special people. We are a chosen people because we have been given this very special responsibility. Two responsibilities, I'd say. The first one is to, to spread the Buddha Dharma teachings of being compassion, compassionate to all sentient beings. The second one, which is equally important, it's really this responsibility of humanizing the Chinese government. We all want to see China becoming an important country in the international community. But at the same time, that importance and that place comes with, with some responsibility. So China cannot really be truly a powerful country unless it addresses some of the problems it has in its backyard and Tibet being one of the most important ones. So I know that life here in the West is really fast. We get caught up in a lot of day-to-day -day things related to work, school, family life. But I would urge, especially all my brothers and sisters here, to not forget that we're here with a very special responsibility, which is to help realize the aspirations of the Tibetan people, which has been manifested in very sad and tragic ways, such as the current spate of self immolations We all know that it is the aspirations of our people back in Tibet to see His Holiness safely return to Tibet and for Tibetans to have more freedom. So regardless of whatever work we do here, we really have to take on that responsibility in whatever way we can. So this is why an evening like this is really important because by coming here and showing your support for the Cultural Center, I think you're kind of demonstrating that you have the commitment. Because it is institutions like, the, like, like this, which is really the, the epicenter of community life, of efforts to preserve and protect our culture and language. So I want to thank all of you for coming here this evening and helping support the Cultural Center here. And lastly, even though our time here is limited this evening, I look forward to meeting all of you and more of you tomorrow morning when I'll have the opportunity to spend more time in the community. And I'd be happy to share more of some of the work we're doing in Washington, D.C., some of the developments in the Dharamsal and in Tibet and take questions and, uh, and also hear from you in terms of your issues, your challenges, your concerns, your comments. So thank you again.